thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, very excited to have Joshua Sotorella um, as our speaker tonight. Um, Josh is a New York based artist whose work positions photography at the nexus of an interdisciplinary practice, relegating all mediums to source material awaiting digital image capture. A few of his recent solo exhibitions include Herkimer Place Complex in New York, The Ski Club in Milwaukee, Higher Pictures in New York, and Ultraviolet Production House Showroom by Bahamas Biennial in Detroit. His work was included in the recent group exhibitions Alt Facts at Postmasters Gallery in New York and Inside Up Upside Down at the Photographer's Gallery in London. Um, as always, this lecture wouldn't be possible without support from the School of Image Arts, as well as FCAD, RCBS, the President's Office, and the Student Initiatives Fund. Uh, we would also like to extend our thanks to Function Magazine, who will be recording this lecture, um, which will be available for reference on their website in the coming months. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Joshua Cinderella. Hi, thank you. Thanks to Convert for having me out here. Uh, I'm going to give a version of a talk that's probably uh, verging on getting too long. Uh, <laughs> so let me, if this is going to automatically shut down, I don't think we'll, we'll be paused for too long. Maybe, let me just, sorry, very unprofessional to make sure this doesn't go to sleep before we, uh, before we start. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background information to start off. Um, where is the displayed energy saver? So I'm uh, 32 years old. I went to the School of Visual Arts and I studied photography. I graduated in 2010 uh, with my, my BFA in, in that discipline. Um, and I just started teaching last year at the School of Visual Arts and I'll start uh, teaching at another place in September as well. Uh, but this kind of talk, I, uh, I think it's geared towards people who are currently enrolled in their BFA and this kind of maps, this is basically the first piece that I did after I graduated, and then it brings you up to now. So hopefully there's something in there that you can take away and have, have some kind of insight and see me experiment, see what works, see what gets dropped throughout the, the process. So I always open with this slide first, and I think this sets up a lot of the things we're gonna talk about later. But uh, it, it began with a, a photograph of this same glass panel standing upright. And at the time, very photo student style, I was interested in questions of representation and truth and fiction and kind of uh, photo 101 nonsense that's not especially interesting to spend too much time on. Uh, and I, I wanted to lean this piece of glass against the life-size print, and I wanted to replicate that three-quarter inch depth. So I called the people I knew who mounted photographs and they said that a three-quarter inch piece of plexi would cost around $600 because it wasn't uh, a standard order. And I sat with that for a few days and I was like, I think this is really important, but I'm not sure how I can possibly afford that. Uh, so what I did was I went down to the art store and I bought uh, two $5 pieces of foam core and I mounted the photograph to that. And then I stitched up the side in Photoshop. So to the knowledge of everyone else on social media that was seeing this, uh, I had $600 to buy a piece of thick plexi. Um, and so when these images, the kind of body of work that we're going to look at now, um, these would be cited uh, online as uh, sculptures. So it would list the title, the date, and then all of the materials in the various uh, dimensions. This is another early piece uh, called Adobe 1998. This one is an actual sculpture, uh, but I, I was able, with the assistance of a few 3D modelers to output the XYZ coordinates of the color space Adobe 1998 and machine it in aluminum to try and make this kind of graspable visualization of, of what that uh, data meant. This is a project that began in 2012 called The PSD Show, which is a website that I made and invited various artists I knew at the time. Um, I think I knew all of them in person or at least over, over email throughout this time. It probably ran up until 2014 but I would invite someone to make uh, essentially a PSD file that would be available on this website. You click to download it, 
and open up that file in your own version of Photoshop. Because it seemed to me, especially at the time in uh, this, uh, this moment of photography, that people were going to the gallery looking at pictures on the wall and talking about Photoshop because that was the, <laughs> the most interesting uh, stuff and the, the most topical. Um, and I just, I, I use this as an example for um, kind of how to get started with this stuff and to um, invite people to do something that is of, uh, you know, a very, um, very low risk or very low effort from, from them, right? Uh, so this is kind of, you know, much easier than carting around a 40 by 50 inch print and arranging shipping. This was my contribution for the piece called Z Axis. That's the title of the piece. And uh, obviously a PSD file. So this was from a commercial job that I did and I er erased and deleted the background layer of the photo to kind of evidence all of the uh, digital immaterial labor that goes into the process. This was the, uh, I think kind of the centerpiece for the real uh, body of work where I kind of first felt like I was uh, onto something that wasn't necessarily in the, the shadow of uh, the, the artists that I looked up to. There's a generation of artists, uh, mostly in New York and in LA at the time, uh, that were about 10 years my senior, and I really kind of modeled my ideas after them, because these, although Photoshop has its roots in 1990, uh, it kind of, it really hadn't worked its way into the mainstream of, of photography discourse. Uh, and my, my year at SVA in photography was the last year they had the color darkroom. So I'm really kind of straddling uh, these two worlds of the, the conventional, like I was trained how to use a four by five and do studio lighting. And I was also very familiar with Photoshop. And uh, oddly at the, the time, none of the professors really knew uh, much more than the students because we had all been kind of using it for the same amount of time. So the classes would be people exchanging tips. Um, so this, this piece uh, is called Render Indifference and I built a four foot by four foot by six foot uh, kind of diorama that was on wheels that could move around the studio. And I had a, uh, a little pot of uh, thermite, which is what uh, magicians essentially mm -hmm. use to uh, cr create these clouds or, or vanish. Um, and I was kind of, I was concerned with um, similar things to the first piece, but uh, kind of more, more updated for the, the digital world. So I was uh, curious in a kind of conventional photo type of inquiry, uh, like how, how do you take a picture of something that's not visible? How would you make a picture of air, right? You could have a picture of uh, a flag blowing in the wind or you would need something to kind of stand in and visually evidence uh, s some kind of phenomena that was not immediately visible. Uh, and, and so this is kind of my, my top to bottom attempt to, to produce a, a fully problematized image that engaged with the, the, the material world the, the photographic world, the lens and the light, the, uh, the digital world, uh, the, the software of Photoshop, and then also his life afterwards on the internet. So I'm pulling a picture from a Google search of clouds, printing out, making material, and then sending it right back up that same chain to uh, kind of um, uh, to sublimate the, uh, the sculpture in a sense. And I'll go through these kind of quickly and, uh, as we get on, but this was uh, another kind of reoccurring theme in this series of uh, converting lead into gold and um, kind, of kind of alchemical transmutation that you can do with Photoshop. Another uh, a detailed piece, and there are a few of these throughout the series. So these pieces were cited as sculptures and I, I uh, began to introduce elements of time or things that would uh, certainly be uh, uh, untenable or ridiculous in the gallery space. So this is a, essentially a sculpture for 125th of a second or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the same, um, the same negative a year later, uh, I remade it. Uh, it's called Transmission of a Single Digital Image Between Two Nodes. This is actually done in Photoshop, it's not, not real lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and here they are together at uh, Foam, I believe in 2014 was the show. And all of these were printed life-size, we retain that kind of erratic relationship to their sculptural uh, components. Uh, this piece is, was part of a, a pretty quick series called, um, it's a long one, it's a long one. Um, Mainframe stores red channel data from REM sleep beta waves. So uh, what that means is um, I'm pulling from something that Star Trek writers would call techno babble, where you put a bunch of prefixes and suffixes <laughs> onto something. And um, you know, if you s 
stretch it out long enough, it seems like it makes sense and has a, has a function. But I wanted to create a, uh, a mainframe, like the, the kind of physical residue of data that was fulfilling a kind of ridiculous uh, function and, and would cite these as, um, as, as sculptures as well, as anodized aluminum, so this green and blue. And these really, um, at the time, I learned pretty quickly that I was um, to some degree alienating my, my audience, that there were too many layers here, uh, and people would be very confused and try to arrange a crate for shipping or, or something like that. Uh, but I, what I wa really wanted to do throughout this body of work was kind of evidence the, the photographic process and the software and these various types of filtration between the art object and its, uh, its life online. Uh, this is the, the high resolution mainframe that's compressing uh, dream data. Uh, Coltan and hard drive, we'll talk more about this later. This one is Big Mac. Uh, <laughs> I, never, I never got to print it, but um, I always really liked it. This was this is something that also appeared on Jogging, which I have a, a sequence of later. Um, the sculpture was called Hourglass, which was kind of an experiment in describing perspectival space, and you'll see a series later where this begins to, uh, to morph. Its, its dimensions are inconsistent, and it takes on various forms to try and uh, make visible that, that, that filtration, that, that uh, event of mediation, uh, and the possibility for intervention. Uh, this piece was called Prima Materia, which is the kind of RGB pixels uh, of Photoshop, and uh, at, at this point, this is later on in the series, kind of the gallery is, is starting to, to come apart. You can see the, uh, the, the room has not yet been painted. I'm allowing, I'll just mouse over this if you can see, uh, that I, I've just copied the ceramic tile to produce a kind of uh, a, a block of marble. And when it was shown, it was shown on a wood floor that uh, I wasn't especially a fan of. It, it seemed like uh, cement floors were much more prestigious to show in that you were, you were on the ground floor if it was cement. So I took the floor from the file and put that over the uh, <laughs> over the actual one. And I, I use this one um, as an example. I try to show them framed as much as possible because as a young photographer, I think we're often tempted to just upload our JPEG and that'll be our portfolio. But if you want to be an artist that specifically shows in galleries, you can kind of give yourself a leg up by showing it you know, in the context. You have a general idea of how, how big this uh, piece is. 46 inches or so, you know, it's it's hung low, but you, you can see it's hung low because you have the, the ceiling in there. Uh, this piece was called A Thousand Pounds of Ash. And this was um, kind of looking more at the, um, the existence of, of digital images as something material. So this whole series is really um, kind of concerned with addressing the, the fuzzy overlap between the, the digital world and the, the real world, IRL and URL, and um, trying to, to create a framework where we could, could paint a picture of the world that would explain both of them, that they were not really uh, different things. So looking at the materiality of data uh, at, at, as the mainframe, and then looking at the, um, the, the image as a kind of energy transport, transfer as um, uh, similar to the piece before of an exchange of energy. And uh, you know, it, uh, I, th I think the best explanation of this is that every Google search has a, uh, a carbon emission attached to it, a, a use of energy, and it's approximate to about boiling uh, a cup of tea. I would sometimes show these, obviously this is immovable, this, that was kind of part of the gag at the time. I was being really slapsticky, but I would show them as details to kind of keep up the shtick that they were actually sculptures. Mm -hmm. And my kind of uh, online like social media um, presence was a bit of a performance that I was playing the role of, or pretending to play the role of being an artist working with materials in the studio. Uh, this is a piece from uh, the first solo show I had um, that you can see these kind of uh, flex or um, kind of uh, this weird disintegration effect that's coming off of the body. This is the recurrence of that, um, uh, the Z axis of, of the kind of all of the cosmetic adjustments that are done to these types of images, they're just moved off of their proper XY grid to kind of evidence the, uh, the, the process. There's like uh, Brechtian uh, breaking the, the fourth wall. And, and this was the first uh, solo show. This is September of 2013 at Higher Pictures. Uh, that I, I chose to put them all on the same wall uh, after seeing these things kind of uh, migrate throughout the internet, that one way to kind of retain context was to take a picture that had the whole show in it. Okay. So 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna move through these uh, as quickly as possible. If there's like a burning uh, question, you can shout it out, but otherwise we'll hold it till later because I think we'll tie up some of these loose threads as we go. Uh, this is um, my contribution to a project that was called Jogging, which began, uh, began in 2009, but then was, was restarted in 2012 with um, probably about like 25 artists passing through it at the time. And uh, jogging was initially based on, uh, it was a Tumblr, an endless scroll Tumblr that uh, consisted of uh, Brad Trammell, myself, uh, Artie Vierkant, uh, who else, Andrew Norman Wilson, Haley Mellon, Rachel Milton, Case the Chew for a period, Born Islamic for a period. There's uh, too, many, too many names to, to uh, mention. Uh, Spencer Longo, uh, for sure, we'll look at his. Uh, works on Jesse Stecklow, um, many, many, many artists, and eventually it was opened up to submission from anybody. And I think and someone did the the analytics; they scraped the the Tumblr, and it was something like, I want to say it was something like five thousand people had had uploaded at the height of this project, which is probably 2014 or so. It was posting 20 times a day, so that's all original content. There's no reblogs or or whatnot. It was all uh, kind of decentralized group of uh, submitters, and they would create. Great works like this that were kind of like viral, um, flippant, you know, internet savvy sculptures. So this was Baguette Cousy that uh, was the product of being um, very hungover one day and then we woke up early in the morning and decided to make some art and that afternoon it had accumulated millions of, of notes. Uh, no notes as likes on Tumblr. I know it sounds so old now. Um, Dor <laughs> Doritos um, Master Lock Taco. This is by Brad Trammell. This one has circulated quite a bit. Uh, these I'm showing some of the all-time greats. There's you know thousands of images for this. So uh, bacon on a hair straightener by Aaron Graham. This was one of the really early ones that um, that went off. At this time, you would go to Tumblr and see things, but there was also like college humor and like all these meme sites. It wasn't organized into the feed yet. It wasn't like you'd just log on to Instagram or Facebook, kind of how it is now, and you'd get everything. You would kind of check you know five or six different places. So we started to lose track of how wide the images were spreading. Uh, some of these we still get Google alerts from. Uh, Mac Bath. This was a really big one. This is Aaron Graham again. And um, the, the full disclosure of the piece was that it was already a broken computer. Uh, and it had been stripped for parts, and he took a picture of it in the bathtub. But this was, I think, when we first learned how, how wide the audience actually was, because he started to receive death threats for it. <laughs> because we, people assume it's a, you know, what is it, a $2,000 computer that he just threw away. Uh, yeah, and this, I, I couldn't find the original, so I just grabbed it from, I guess the site is Meme Center. Um, this is, I forget the name of the submitter, but this is kind of in that, that jogging style. Uh, they, they would call it a kludge. A kludge is uh, kind of like an internet term for one object fitting perfectly into another. So you would, um, you know, the, the kind of classic example is putting tennis balls into a, a Pringles can. Um, and, and it kind of had this funny middle ground where, um, the kind of formal uh, similarity between, between two culturally unrelated objects is quite similar to like the strategy for a lot of conceptual sculpture. So it <laughs> occupied this high and low type of art uh, at, at the same time. Uh, and uh, to the, the, Brad has a great essay about this called The Accidental Audience about how these images uh, migrate through the internet. That most of the people seeing it were not especially familiar with uh, you know, art at all. Uh, so this became a way of kind of like a, almost like a popular modernism of you could, you could um, kind of plug ideas into this and maybe do some agenda setting or shift the zeitgeist if you have a really, really viral image. This is uh, Batteries in Frozen Powerade by Spencer Longo. Um, Occupy parking lots. I still get uh, Google alerts for this one especially and I never really understood why. Sometimes it's like a, a you know, luck of the, the dice too. You, you, never, you never quite know. You start to learn over time. But um, yeah, this, so this was the physical exhibition that was in the summer of 2013 or 14. I, I, I don't remember exactly. We did it, uh, a residency at the, the Still House in, um, in New York. These are uh, Hot Topic hair extensions in a frozen uh, polar ice core. Uh, rationed water, which is uh, Powerade and Gatorade mixing on uh, a table coated in um, hydrophobic film. Does anyone remember these videos that were, uh, they were really viral for a while and they would like spray a t-shirt with something and then they'd spray it with chocolate sauce and it would just like melt right off and wouldn't even set. So we started to use um, kind of these viral material videos 
as the, the source that we incorporate into our, into our sculptures. And one of the real kind of points of contention in the group and this, this specific period of transitioning from doing art online to doing art in the gallery was why go to an exhibition when you can get all the high res images at home. So to, to really directly kind of front load that content, we uh, did intentionally kind of like spectacular works. Like wh when you see this puddle of water that comes to a kind of right angle, uh, this like miraculous, unexplainable uh, uh, table, it's, um, it, it, it feels like magic. It's something that you want to see in person that you, you kind of don't really believe it in the image. Um, this is kind of a happy accident of seeing the, the, sh the striations of the two materials mixing. We would call them magic materials. Uh, it was kind of like a tongue in cheek term, but um, this one is a genetically modified triplet watermelon. Um, and on the top of it, there's a pitcher suspended from chains that was pouring a material called museum gel. Uh, museum gel is used by conservators to protect cl uh, crystal and glassware in case of an, an earthquake or uh, some kind of uh, tremors so that it doesn't fall and break. But in, in a photograph, it looks like perfectly still, crystal clear water pouring out of the jug. Um, but this would slowly, <laughs> slowly trickle down and you see these kind of strings and then it would like consolidate back into this crystal clear liquid. Um, that was really uh, some, something unique to see in an exhibition. Uh, uh, the, the how, how to describe them? Um, this was uh, a website <laughs> uh, in the beginning and then kind of became a hub for a lot of this work. Uh, and they have their own art practice. They curated the uh, Berlin Biennale, uh, the, the most recent one. And there, this was from a project called Dis Images, which was a fully functioning stock photography website. And they uh, invited various artists to uh, produce content for this website. So you could, you know, if you are looking for a picture of a person to put in your ad, you could go to Dis Images, buy the rights for it, uh, and, and, you know, composite or, or use it in your, your advertisement as you so choose. So our kind of response to it was to create something so incredibly specific that it could never be used for <laughs> stock photography, um, which we really shot ourselves in the foot with that. But I, I guess that was kind of the idea. So using their kind of, at this time, it was a pretty vast network of, of people. Uh, shot at uh, Suzanne Geis Gallery in New York. And um, we managed to invite a few of the gallery girls from the uh, TV show, reality TV show Bravo. And we decided to put them, um, have them interact with the kind of most viral, viral, iconic jogging sculptures and have them kind of perform a character in uh, a setting. So we kind of like almost like an Excel spreadsheet of, um, of variables that would increasingly narrow it down to maybe an audience of one at the end, where the stock image is kind of intentionally uh, benign and generic and has an audience of, of infinity. Uh, so this is Angela Pham with a <laughs> Doritos Lock Taco uh, as a Lululemon yoga mom meditating in a California forest fire. <laughs> and here she has successfully reached Nirvana or some tier of it, and it has you know, subsequently extinguished the fire. Uh, uh, Ch Chantel, oh god, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed. I forget, I forget her, her last name. Um, but uh, with the baguette koozie wearing the um, uh, tap out for her uh, at the Coliseum. Uh, the uh, Whole Foods Hot Topic hat, blowtorching a crayon painting, taking a selfie at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and, and this was the batteries at Frozen Powerade um, at, in the Lower East Side uh, after Hurricane Sandy and dressed as a sea punk. So um, to put a, a little bit of this timeline together, uh, these are kind of all happening at the same time. <laughs> so this was actually built in the, the summer of 2013, and I, I had that, that physical show um, in September, and then these were released in uh, kind of the winter or, or January of 2014. But it's kind of you're seeing all these ideas kind of percolate at the same time. So th this is a project that uh, I, I did called um, Compression Artifacts, which was a physical gallery built at an undisclosed location, AKA my parents' backyard. Uh, and, but I didn't let anybody know that at the time. So I invited uh, a, a group of artists that I knew in New York and I said, you, like, you know, take this risk with me. I don't know what it's gonna be, but let me borrow a piece 
Um, and so there's works from Artie Vierkan, Kate Sachu, Brad Trammell, Wyatt Niehaus, and myself, that piece in the center that you saw before. Um, and so this is kind of the first, like the, the only establishing shot where you see where it is at this kind of you know, un, un, unknown location. And everything else uh, it is going to be a kind of close-up crop, like a regular install of the gallery. So I live streamed the, the construction of it. Uh, it's, it's a relatively you know, humble space, it's not, it's not enormous, um, but we're going to see it transform throughout the, the sequence. So it begins with a pretty, pretty you know, minor transformation of the center sculpture. And now the, the space has expanded, uh, works are on different walls. All of the works have become uh, printed pieces in a frame, and the space has gotten a little wider. Now all the work has disappeared, and there's suddenly a, a ceiling. I, I quite like this uh, kind of imprint of the sand as a type of index, or like a similar to a photographic index of proof that something was there. And then, then it starts to get a little, a little stranger. Pieces flip, pieces flip from different walls. Uh, we kind of intentionally chose works that would allow for themselves to be edited through software. So this, this piece could be against the right wall or the left wall, and you could then flip it and transform the space as you so choose. Uh, expanding the, the architecture and allowing the works to start to, to fray on the edges. Bringing in these kind of, uh, again, like raw materials that would be this kind of index of photographic truth that uh, kind of, it, it looked like something from like an Angel Fire website, if you're like hand coding HTML in high school. Uh, and, and a kind of similar aesthetic on the um, no, no, on the, the water droplets there, but they were all quite physical works, and you could kind of tell that through the, the slight seams left in the image. Mm -hmm. uh, so the kind of the overarching kind of experiment here was to see if on a, a budget of probably like five hundred dollars, those you know, construction materials are, are are very cheap. It's really the, the labor and the time to see um, uh, on a budget of five hundred dollars if you could build. Hauser and Worth in your parents' backyard, right? So that works to a certain extent. Um, you'll, you see, I always use this image to, uh, to describe it, like how the project failed, that in the front, I'll mouse over this, you could kind of see up here that the, uh, the distance between the fluorescent tubes has gotten really small. Um, and then there's a kind of a scale issue, which is why there's no works in there, that it, it just kind of works on you and the more time you spend with it, it starts to fall apart. But it seemed, it seemed at the time that there was some kind of opportunity to, uh, to, to kind of like reach past or remove the unnecessary gatekeepers um, that we were, I think still, um, my generation of people got into this idea of doing art on the internet because we thought it would be in some way liberatory, uh, that it would set the artist free. Uh, we're gonna talk about that a, a bit more later, but this, I think the kind of, the overarching theme of this work is really, um, Seeing, seeing where those things fail and uh, you know, where, where the tensions lie. And they get, they get progressively uh, stranger throughout and, and by this time you've, you've tipped your hand uh, and it's a bit of theater. This is, this is a GIF actually, but oh, it, it expands. You've, you've probably seen enough by now, keep us moving. Uh, so after, after the show was posted, uh, or sorry, after, after the show was photographed, I then disassembled the whole thing and I burned all of the material. So all that wood and, and stuff has um, then been uh, collected as ash. So there's no kind of, there's no trace. You know, you didn't know where it was and there's no physical evidence to go back to. Perhaps it didn't exist at all. And that's been kind of, you know, creating, like uh, allowing people to think that it's a hoax. Some people are still uncertain. Uh, shifting uh, gears a little bit, this is now bringing us up to 2015 and This, uh, this body of work deals with, um, deals with two things. The, uh, the kind of perceived uh, infinity of uh, the like, copy pl paste as applied to ideology that, uh, that, that tech would kind of allow us to transcend material uh, relations. So, um, the idea, and this is kind of a recurring theme, that social media and the internet in general is kind of this horizontal space in which one like is one vote for one user, uh, that it would create a level playing field and a kind of um, a, a true meritocracy. So 
the, for me, I think the biggest counter to that kind of idea, um, tracing this kind of, the, the, the highest tech in the world down to its, its really um, early uh, material roots. So this is a, a material called coltan. 80% uh, of the world's supply, or, uh, supply of coltan exists in the Democratic Republic of Congo in an area that is uh, still to this day controlled by militias uh, and is uh, control over these minerals is essentially tied to uh, dominance of, of those regimes. And these are uh, groups that are implicating the, uh, really the, the, the worst uh, war crimes and violation of uh, human rights that have existed in recent times. So this material, coltan, is in our iPhone, it's in this laptop right now, it's in your microwave, it's in the projector. Anything that has a circuit board that has electronics in it has coltan built into its capacitors. And this tech doesn't exist without it. So what I'm trying to do through this body of work is to um, front load the um, uh, finitude of this material and the, um, the, the kind of all, all the, the violence embedded in it and juxtapose that against the infinitude of uh, the, the digital color space and this kind of um, perceived endless utopia and uh, a horizontality of digital media. You can see a kind of direct uh, copy paste on these here. Uh, and I'm allowing, these are uh, kind of layered panels mounted on top of each other that show the backdrop, the backdrop of the um, kind of in infinite uh, color space, just infinite di digital space. A few, a few different variations of it. So th these works were shown at Carol Fletcher in 2016. Uh, the show is called Planetary Scale Computation. And it included several uh, sand drawings that were taken. Uh, the source for these images was taken from a patent filed by Google in 2009 that claims the intellectual property rights for a water-based data center. So um, a, a kind of interesting factoid is that the highest cost of the data center is actually its uh, energy consumption. It's, it's the air conditioning bill. That's why they're built way underground. Uh, and the, the idea, or the idea as they describe it, is that you could use the ocean as a perpetual motion machine and that the, the churning of ocean currents would power a turbine and you could pump the cold ocean water up, which would absorb the heat. And uh, not only could you save on the energy bill, but you could also pl uh, place these closer to coastal cities, which consume the, the most of the, the internet traffic and need access to that data. Um, the kind of undiscussed subtext of this idea is that if you had a water-based data center that didn't need to draw its energy from anywhere, that you could place these in international waters and you could in effect practice a type of digital sovereignty and not be uh, regulated by the, the laws of any geopolitically defined nation state, which is essentially the, the business plan for most of what Silicon Valley proposes, which is either to uh, break the law and then make up for it afterwards, or to uh, start your business and lobby to change the law, or mm -hmm. find areas that uh, have not yet been regulated and extract uh, value from them. These are a few of these. Uh, the other, this is the, the uh, turbine itself that would pump the, the water up. Uh, oh, sorry, this is, this is the, the battery and this is the turbine that would pump the water up from the, the sand, uh, the, from the ocean. Um, so just to uh, dispel any, any kind of myths, so this material is not actually coltan, it's about like $10 aquarium sand that you can buy, uh, but it has the kind of, you know, um, verisimilitude, it looks identical to coltan, and the kind of, it, it was unfixed on the floor, it was very fragile, and I'm kind of um, incentivizing or asking visitors to photograph it on their phone because it's so fragile. And by doing that, I'm, I'm implicating them in, in the process, that the, uh, the provenance of the material is not in the sculpture, but it's in the, the process of documentation. And these were um, versions of this work that included um, kind of epoxy pores on, on top of it uh, as well, having like you know, a third or, or fourth layer coming off of it. And this is, this is where it gets, uh, 
a, a, a little more um, fun. We could use some levity, I think. Um, so this was a, uh, a residency with myself and Brad Trammell, who was also a collaborator on jogging. And we were in uh, Times Square for a little less than a month. Um, we worked in this project called UV Production House for about two years. And I'll give you a uh, kind of brief description of what that project was. UV takes images from product advertisements and stock photography. We combine those images in Photoshop to create hypothetical projects which are then listed on Etsy. Upon purchase, all constituent materials, including tools for production and fabrication tutorials, are sent to the collector who then assembles the work themselves. The pricing structure is 2x the materials cost. Amazon Prime is our free shipping and unlimited storage. Our inventory of materials is anything available for purchase on the internet. UV is a completely outsourced, zero overhead, post studio, ultra lean, cloud based model for artistic practice in an age of mounting debt and declining profits. <laughs> so that's kind of, that's kind of it. Um, and so in, in no particular order here, uh, I'm just going to read some of these titles because it's, it's a little bit, there's a lot going on here. Um, meat smoker or pet cremation chamber and thermoelectric conversion phone charger from meat heat. And so this was a kind of Pinterest recipe for a barbecue that could also be used as a pet cremation device. And it's a real thing, a thermoelectric charger that converts uh, the heat portion of the electromagnetic spectrum to uh, electricity. And I, I kind of, I like this um, kind of cyclical thing of that you know, as, as you cremate your pet and it charges your phone, you can look back on photos of them and in some way they're still, they're still alive from the, from the energy. Um, and we, we played with various ways of promoting this on social media. So this was a kind of starter pack that would kind of elucidate uh, what was going on here. Because most people were, uh, uh, had, had trouble grasping it at first. So we, we tried to inundate them. We probably made five of these a week. Uh, there's maybe like 200 uh, pieces we made. Because we really had the ability to explore any idea almost instantly. You could make it, put it up that evening, um, see if anyone bought it. There was really... There's no cost, there's no studio overhead, there's no material overhead. Uh, aquarium backpack, that's uh, kind of self-explanatory. Oh, and I should mention that the, um, the prices for these were also all available on the Etsy store, obviously. And they kind of, uh, as uh, a little bit of a jab at the opacity of the art market, uh, the nice thing about Etsy was that the prices were all visible, but also you had a chronological record of all the sales that had happened. Uh, Closed circuit seasonal effective disorder lamp, USB forever solar powered by its own light, $1,000. Shit hits the fan spa package, portioned ingredients to make your own antiperspirant, blush, bath mix, and or thermite IED. Farm to table table. <laughs> Why have we been hanging all these solar panels when we've had lemons here the entire time? <laughs> Go ahead, I'll wait. So this is in our, um, our kind of search for uh, online tutorials, we went to Pinterest a lot. Pinterest has a tremendous maker and kind of how-to culture. Uh, and, and what we found is that you could find a really kind of interesting, peculiar image, which is this, uh, this tiny light bulb being powered by a lemon. And then they would give you a step-by-step -step guide. So this was kind of perfect fodder for us that we could kind of what we plug in uh, different variables and uh, and kind of cr create our own in artistic intervention. So the kind of subtext of a lot of these were um, the, uh, the, the difficulty of small scale local solutions uh, scaling to confront macroeconomic problems of resource allocation. So I think this is maybe the best example of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Taking Richard Florida literally. This artist has been called the Katarina Gross of driving a truck full of paint into shuttered businesses to spur regional economic growth, $100,000. <laughs> you didn't even choose the neighborhood. Help end gentrification by moving wherever this sky lantern takes your iPhone in a Ziploc bag. <laughs> Airbnb housing solution. Remain on your Lower East Side apartment's fire escape in a hanging tent while guests pay off your monthly rent. True dedication, these collectors love wall work so much they don't even own a floor. <laughs> Puppy treadmill, adopt local shelter dogs to exercise healthy cardio as clean electric engines to offset the cost of their upkeep. Why did I buy this anyway? How to hide those unseemly hard to move tax deductibles until next season. 
New York, Miami, Venice project space proposal. Build a gallery near a coastal region below ground and hold all inventory on hand in hopes of an insurance payout for inevitable flooding. <laughs> so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, kind of imminent environmental collapse. And just to share a brief anecdote about this particular piece, um, during Hurricane Sandy, many of the galleries in Chelsea uh, had their work stored in the, the basement. And the flooding obviously destroyed many feet, like six feet of, of work. So the general response from the art world was kind of bemoaning the loss of these incredibly important cultural objects. But the kind of glaring, glaringly obvious undiscussed portion of that is that this is all the unsold inventory from years of shows. And what happened for many of these galleries is they got the full price insurance payout and paid the artists for work that had no value in the marketplace. So that's a little, little interesting fact. Um, family growth charts, map your child's yearly height in comparison to the projected rise of sea levels over the next 100 years. <laughs> Eight values political quiz bookshelf. We'll talk about some of this stuff later. A bubble, $100. Incense fence. This is, so as you can see, like when we started this project, it was um, kind of small scale things. We were thinking like, you know, uh, like tabletop sculpture almost. And obviously in some of the previous work, I've been doing a lot of still life and kind of thinking in that scale. Um, but we started to realize that, you know, the, the internet has essentially like anything that exists, there's a photograph of it. And if there's a photograph of it, someone's willing to sell it to you. So we could start to scale these things up and behave more like content producers than studio artists. So this was probably one of the most ambitious uh, things that we had come up with. And um, in summer of 2017, we were invited to do a physical exhibition of UV Production House at Bahamas Biennale in Detroit. And we wanted to really kind of bring our A game and show kind of the burden of proof that these things were possible. So we ended up making the fence. This is a detailed photo of it. And it was kind of smoking in the gallery. Again, this kind of this, this element of, of theater or spectacle uh, like magic materials, something to draw you in. is a more zoomed out version. And the full piece was 14 feet wide by uh, four feet tall. Uh, and it is a little bit of um, a, a fabrication nightmare. I probably inhaled uh, a number of chemicals that will, will come back to harm me later. But it's, uh, it really uh, kind of like, I think like the crown jewel of, of the project is, is figuring out how to go from this image and then make it into a real unbelievable material object. These are some of the, some of the other works that were uh, shown in that show. Okay, and that kind of brings us up, up to date to the like recent body of work. Uh, so this is the piece called SWIM a few years from now. SWIM is an internet acronym uh, that is used for uh, essentially anonymity. You'll find it a lot on, on, on drug forums, but also maybe uh, Antifa message boards. And it stands for someone who isn't me. Uh, and this is a portrait of a precarious freelancer in his micro apartment in New York City several years in the future. And Manhattan has been flooded up to the first and a half floor. All the goods are delivered by canoe, uh, delivery boys running across the rooftops. There's a drone circulating somewhere in the background. But this is a kind of fully privatized world where um, kind of all uh, all civil services have been uh, halted in favor of, of private entity, entities. So it's not just your schools and your healthcare, it's your, your garbage pickup and uh, in every aspect of society. So people become ultra efficient and you can see in this picture, I'll kind of mouse over some of these things, that he's collecting rainwater from the roof, um, which is filtered into um, a kind of off-grid survivalist recipe of gravel, charcoal, and sand that then is uh, filtered into the vertical potato farm, which is the most amount of caloric nutrition you can get from the least amount of uh, input materials, and then gathered into the tank to create the, uh, um, the water pressure to flush the toilet that drains out through the, the shower pan underneath. And it's, it's kind of not really clear if it's day or night or, or what's happening. Um, and he's kind of, he's waiting, the loading sign on his, uh, his computer is waiting to be pinged for the next job. And he's working a zero hour contract uh, for whoever is going to, to hire him next. Um, and you can see kind of the, the classic survivalist uh, dried goods being, being hoarded and um, all of these kind of uh, off-grid survivalist recipes, the, the go bag in the top as well. Uh, what we found 
was, was quite interesting on Pinterest is that um, we'd click a link and then wouldn't be sure if it was going to take us to some kind of new age hippie crystal healing website or a kind of like off-grid libertarian like gun forum because this, this culture of uh, self-sufficiency and DIY uh, breaks in, in various kind of interesting ways. And we could kind of roughly describe these as um, the ethical consumer, which is someone who brings their whole, uh, th th their tote bag to Whole Foods. Um, they're, they're concerned about their consumption. They try to make ethical choices. Um, and then they buy fair trade coffee, things like this. And the, and the other one um, was the kind of the prepper, the doomsday prepper, the off-grid uh, survivalist. But oddly enough, um, these two groups, which kind of occupy completely uh, diametrically opposed positions in the, uh, the ideological spectrum, um, they had a shared material vocabulary. So they both like solar panels, they both like uh, um, rainwater collection barrels, they both like rooftop gardens. And uh, we, we started to think like if there's a shared material overlap, then there must be a kind of like shared ideological overlap as well. And the kind of the, the similarity between it, which is almost too obvious to mention, is one of those things that you, you only really recognize when you zoom out, is that both of these worldviews position the individual as the, 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 the center of, of all of society's future. So either you need to correct your individual actions or you need to take care of the world because society is, is going to collapse. But they're equally kind of convinced of an, of an imminent disaster. And we'll, we'll touch on some of those topics uh, again later. So this is... Um, the first one was Ancapistan. This is Transhumania, which is a, um, uh, a sovereign floating seastead that's a uh, fully automated kind of luxury society. Um, and the uh, floating in the harbor of the San Francisco Bay. Uh, and the, the skyline is filled with, um, uh, w with slums. And some of these... Um, I think one of my favorite uh, metaphors for this kind of tech accelerationism is uh, is the Juicero over here in the corner, which I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with it, but the Juicero was this kind of, uh, you'd buy the, the, the little machine and then you'd have a subscription to these like really expensive bags of uh, uh, juice. Or, sorry, the machine was incredibly expensive and the juice was cheap. And you'd put it in there and it would come out into your cup, empty out underneath. And uh, a very enterprising journalist in the New York Times found that you could just squeeze the juice out of the bag and not need to buy the machine in the first place. <laughs> so they, the kind of the funny thing is that in, instead of kind of s solving society's ills, these uh, the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs tend to like invent nonsensical solutions for uh, being able to flush your toilet from the other room while on your smartphone. Things that that we don't really need. <laughs> um, so this this is the physical show. There's kind of a little bit of a juxtaposition of how the other half lives. And this is the, um, the recent piece which is being produced now that um, I'll, I'll discuss some of these, uh, some of this research uh, that I'll kind of give some background on this piece. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe um, something that is, I think for me, tying up uh, a few years of, of interest, of, uh, of virality, of um, the kind of political implications of network culture, of uh, latent ideologies in tech. Um, and this is from um, a, a book that I released that was kind of a work in studio diary, in progress images and what I made that year. And then I started writing um, about the activity of a, a kind of uh, online subculture I was following and one of these books was uh, available at a bookstore in the East Village in New York. And someone from the community went and bought that book and scanned it and put it online. And it circulated very quickly after that. Uh, so it's been a kind of interesting journey ever since. But I'll give you, uh, I'm going to read a small section from that. And I'm sure there'll be a ton of questions afterwards. It's a, it's a, it's a really rich subject, I think. Record scratch, freeze frame. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got in this situation. It all goes back to some early studio visits in 2012. I remember telling people that much of the internet's viral content was made by young teenagers. This was usually met by strange looks of disbelief. Just a few years later, this idea seems so commonplace, it's almost not worth mentioning. As part of the artist collaborative jogging, 
I got to see this play out in real time on Tumblr. I would routinely encounter original content, OC, accounts, run by pseudonymous tweens. Their viral images would reach audiences numbered in the millions. As an amateur anthropologist of internet culture, I've always made it a point to follow these accounts. As is the case for most visual artists, my primary social media platform was Instagram. My feed was an intermingling of the conventional art world and OC producers on the long tail of improbable subcultures which thrive in the nichefied environment of the internet. Among these accounts was a group of libertarian teenagers whose online activity began to rapidly heat up in 2015 alongside the American primary races. This particular community had an odd set of political ideals. Mostly intent on shitposting ironic or trollish content, they were self-described anarcho-capitalists. These kids were obsessed with various philosophies centered around property rights. Everything in the world had to be analyzed through the principles of non-aggression and homesteading. They would describe capitalism as, quote, a highly ethical system of voluntary transactions between mutually consenting parties. From their perspective, the true source of tyranny and oppression throughout history was the monopoly power of governments. Now, don't let the capitalism part throw you off just yet. While they were deeply right-wing in their property views, they were also radical individualists and subsequently pro-diversity. The meme goes something like this, quote, I want gay married couples to protect their marijuana plants with unregistered firearms they bought with Bitcoin. They are anti-state and pro-freedom. Any disparaging general generalization about a group was seen as an attack on the rights and character of those members, of, of those members as individuals. These kids would constantly battle mainstream conservatives in the common threats. To the end caps, everyone was a sovereign citizen. The inherent contradictions of their belief system, lack of historical knowledge, and clear desire to evangelize for civil liberties made this a fascinating and mostly harmless subculture to observe. This began to change in 2015. The presidential primaries are a generally divisive process for the United States. They ravage social media in the form of endless Facebook threads and Twitter wars. For young ideologues, it sets off a dramatic chain of events that culture and media experts are still struggling to explain. In the ANCAP communities, these previously anti-hierarchical anarchists soon gravitate towards highly authoritarian ideals. Social media overflows with memes featuring libertarian thinker Hans Hermann Hoppe and dictator Augusto Pinochet. Their desire for a society of civil law soon morphs into civic nationalism and ultimately into ethno-nationalism. The elaborate Rube Goldberg machine of avoiding contradictions in their own belief system is truly astounding to watch. In the mainstream media, this group becomes popularly known as the alt-right. Like most of the people at the time, I did not take this group seriously. I considered them just to be another anomaly in the cultural atomization brought about through the internet. I soon learned that these, and that these users are enmeshed in a much larger and highly active community called Politogram. This is exactly what it sounds like, political radicals on Instagram. In my experience, the demographic composition here is mostly young white males between ages 12 and 17, with some notable exceptions. Similar communities exist on Reddit, 4chan, Tumblr, and just about every other platform. Instagram seems to skew the youngest of them all. Every political ideology you can think of is thriving and memeing on Politogram. While the far right's impact on social media and public debate is more visible, there exists a great diversity of opinion in these spaces which remains largely unexplored. At a time when the rest of social media had gathered into ideologically quarantined filter bubbles, politogrammers were intentionally following their political opponents. They loved to argue. These kids would constantly troll each other at all hours. They hosted video debates on YouTube and later Instagram Live. In these circles, there is no greater cachet than to embarrass your opponent through skilled argument. Slut for DPRK annihilates Hoxha versus the revisionists in an epic, co epic common thread that is screenshotted and regrammed throughout the whole community. For all of their deep ideological disagreements, there's a remarkable camaraderie amongst the members. Virginia, Virginia for Bernie can comment LOL on a post by Gecko versus the state, even though they are diametrically opposed in their political beliefs. As Politogram grew in size, various accounts emerged to organize events for the community, debates, model UN, and live stream interviews. Several accounts began to report on the community itself, relaying news about admin accounts, stirring up drama between users, and distributing screenshots of the all-time best comment burns. A wiki was started and maintained for a brief period of time. Politogrammers revel in adding as many prefixes and suffixes to their ideology as possible. Sometimes I think there are as many ideologies as there are members of Politogram. Some of the more unusual titles I've come across 
national Trotskyism, Dharmic eco-reactionaryism, libertarian neo-monarchism, traditional primifatist caliphatism, Christian Bolshevism, the list goes on. Similar to the identity politics culture of Tumblr, these spaces are deeply individuated and users often list their relevant info at the header of their page. Most accounts maintain a follower count of around 1,000 to 2,000. We'll talk a little more about that, about that later, I'm sure. Uh, the, individu the individuated style of these profiles implies a latent anti-collectivism within the culture and the platform itself. We might ask what use is a political party of one? This is a topic for a whole other project. At the time, my interest in exploring this space is to find an online left that can compete with the social media impact of the alt-right. It seemed obvious that after the ubiquity of social media, any progressive political movement would require some degree of a populist base. This space would need its own department of outreach, the memesters, the influencers, and the online personalities that work to prime new followers for radicalization. The far right did this extraordinarily well leading up to the 2016 presidential election. My practice became an extensive research project into the underbelly of online radical groups. I would find the counter movement, prognosticate its rise, and turn the tide of American politics, or so I hoped. In a strange way, Instagram feels like the old internet of portal links. The interface is clunky and filled with cumbersome click-throughs. There is no way to use quantitative data or scrape analytics in this closed system. Politogram can't be visualized from the outside. It must be explored qualitatively from within. Search results yield mainstream meme accounts, paid posts, and merch stores ready to monetize their followings. Accounts which have been featured in the mainstream media or have too many followers are generally, dis generally not trusted. They're normies. Unlike on Instagram, unlike on Facebook, Instagram, and Instagram, users do not mutually subscribe to each other's posts when connecting. In a one-way subscriber system, word of mouth has a high value. A shout out from a more popular account can be a powerful endorsement. Otherwise, sifting, sifting through the common threads is usually the best way to uncover the core accounts and OC tastemakers within the community. Politogram is a haven for both ideologues and trolls. They are interested in experimenting and trying on new worldviews. Remember, these are mostly kids in middle school and high school. Some users manage different accounts aligned with different ideologies. Users often involved in their views, deleted all their content, changed their name, and started fresh. Many politogrammers will periodically take various political compass tests and update their followers about how their views are evolving. So I'm going to just pause from the, the text and explain a little bit of what this is because it'll have a, create a good framework for the things we're about to see. Um, so you have your right and left spectrum of uh, private ownership or, or collective ownership. And then the, the Y uh, axis is uh, libertarian to authoritarian, which is essentially um, what degree do you think the role of the state plays in organizing your perfect ideological utopia? So kind of at the, at the bottom of the libertarian left, you could imagine someone like, uh, like Noam Chomsky, and then at the top, uh, the authoritarian left, you have a figure like uh, Stalin. Uh, the, uh, the authoritarian right is uh, uh, fascists, and then the, the ANCAP kids that I was describing before, like a, a Murray Roth Rothbard or like a, a Rand Paul type character, is in the deregulation, anti-state, libertarian right. This type of post is most commonly referred to as my political journey. Think of it as a viral personality quiz for political extremists. Instead of taking a test where it tells you what type of Harry Potter character you are, like a Slytherin or a, a Gryffindor or whatnot, uh, this, this tells you what your political ideology is, and they, they approach it quite similarly. Uh, users will discuss where they started and where they think they might be headed. While these quizzes are certainly reductive, they do seem to be relatively accurate in that members of closely affiliated groups score reasonably close to each other on a consistent basis. And this screenshot is kind of the general, uh, the gen general arc of what I uh, observed in this, this process, process of the, the emergence of this new online right. Without psychologizing these users too much, there's most definitely a profile that applies to many of the edgelord teens. I try to keep in mind that these kids are products of their environments. They are shaped by cultural and economic forces beyond their immediate control. From their few and infrequent earnest personal posts, often deleted within minutes, one quickly learns that many of them struggle with depression, social isolation, family problems, and trouble at school. For social outcasts, the temptation to troll the real world and sow political chaos 
can often be overwhelming. At the same time, it is hard to have sympathy for anyone who openly advocates violence against others. My rules for this research were to follow but not interact and to report any credible threat of real world violence. A full ethnography of Politogram is a project for someone with much more experience than I. These spaces bleed into nearly infinite subcultures. I sat down to write this essay because I was inspired by the story of a specific group of online left anarchist teens whose political evolution is outlined in some detail in the latter portion of this book. I think their story might offer us some insight towards the formation of young radicals under our current media paradigm. It might tell us something about what is happening in the, young, in the minds of young American malcontents. This particular group began as self-described syndicalists, socialists, or otherwise lefties. Over the course of three years, they evolved into something much darker. These platform spaces accelerate radicalization in unprecedented ways. The role of memes in 2016 is a phenomenon whose aesthetic significance cannot be overemphasized. To be clear, memes did not win the election for Republicans. Still, the appearance of memes on mainstream media and numerous posts by members of the administration and First Family are all evidence that these images are not going unappreciated. If you were to describe the 2016 meme war absent a, a political ideology, it might sound structurally similar to some of the reasons my generation of artists got involved with art and social media. Consider a mass leaderless, a mass leaderless online movement organized around open source digital images which create cultural agitations and contribute to a major shift in public discourse at a volatile time in history. It sounds a bit like some naive California ideology, but certainly those aspirations align with the more techno-utopian hopes that myself and many of my peers shared when we first started getting involved with art online. As young artists, we thought that social media was going to liberate culture and society in general. Many to many networks would rid us of the corrupt gatekeepers and institutions. The artists would be set free. LMAO, we quickly learned how flawed that strategy was, now all of social media has learned it too. While it would be a mistake to assume that all Politogram accounts are honest narrators, communicate their politics in good faith, or are aware of their underlying motivations, it is extremely clear that among them exist users with earnest and strongly held ideological convictions. As time goes on and the barriers to entry increase, the, ideal the ratio of ideologues to trolls goes up. To be fair, I do not want to oversell the level of discourse going on in these communities. Part of everything is trolling, and the other part is still mostly the work of ill-informed, angsty teenagers. What I found most curious is that in a moment where mainstream political debate began to narrow into, quote, what is realistically possible within the existing system, the Overton window for these radical kids grew wider than ever. The window of political possibilities generally shifts left or right in accordance with the cultural forces of the time, any moment of bi-directional expansion is an anomaly worth investigating. As the culture wars mania of 2016 accelerated, I took sharp notice of these divergent trends in my feed. Today, the electoral strategy of aiming for the center has been proven to be a failure. No one gets excited to compromise. The level of discourse in these online circles was mediocre at best, but I can't help to wonder if there is something important we might learn from their viral tactics and broad horizon of political possibilities. At the very least, watching their activity might help tip us off to new ideological currents before they hit the mainstream. Almost finished up in the wall of time. I'm sure there's a, people have a lot of opinions on, and questions on this topic. Um, so for the, the full version of this it is uh, available online. Um, I originally wrote this next bit of text as part of a press release for a show in January of 2018. He makes a decent introduction for the community we're about to explore. At a moment when globalism sits at the center, center stage of public debate, extremist positions are moving into the mainstream. These pictures imagine two speculative futures which the internet knows well, and Kapistan and Transhumania. Each of these ideologically uncompromising worlds demands radical, de re <laughs> demands radical deregulation and the privatization of nearly all aspects of social life. They are frequently invoked by branches of the libertarian right, which view the existence of government in general as either tyranny, bloat, or plain old-fashioned corruption. Their proposed solutions most often involve creating a dynamic and competitive marketplace for governance. In these, system, in these systems, citizens, quote, vote with their feet by leaving one sovereignty to join another. This manifests as the voluntary secession and breaking apart of larger states into self-organizing patchworks of micronations and of course abolishes the federal government income tax and most all regulations that get in the way of market efficiency. Open trade and open borders, so long as the border community likes you. 
These works itemize the material and ide ideological systems of radical groups as described by the radicals themselves. On social media, the radical left had poorly organized and smaller followings compared to the prevalence of high engagement far right accounts. The liberals, environmentalists, dem socks, syndicalists, MLs, ANCOMs, Trotskyists, leftcoms, fully automated luxury communists, communalists, communizers, Posadists, Maoists, third worldists, tankies, etc., etc., and so on, all hated each other. The online right was equally divided, but somehow managed to coordinate cultural agitations that contributed to events which are now reshaping our political reality. As image makers and students of culture, i.e. artists, all of this should be really important to us. We can probably learn a few things. If a 1970s stack is already not working for today's internet, then the same goes for the art world. Both cultural spheres are hamstrung by similar, similarly outmoded tactics which bar us from wielding real influence. We remain trapped in the 20th century. After two years searching social media, I found little evidence towards the online left unity for which I had hoped. What I did find were many vibrant and surprisingly active communities of the post-left, anti-civilization eco-anarchist groups scattered across various chat servers. Their style is witty and cutthroat, radically inclusive, multicultural, LGBTQ, pro-diversity, posting 24 hours a day at the speed of 4chan. Quote, race, class, gender is a social construct and we must do away with all of it. They reject traditional strategies of collective bargaining and coalition building. They conceive of markets as essentially ahead of regulation. Quote, how can progressivism be pro progressive if regulation itself is reactionary? Technological progress creates new markets faster than, than they can be regulated. Civilization means an inevitable drift to the right. Anything other than dismantling civilization is only a temporary stopgap, which by design cannot hold back the brutal efficiency of capitalist acceleration. Themes of nihilism are pervasive within this group. Some are self-described cyber nihilists. Many have favorable opinions towards various eco-extremist organizations. Literally teenage Deleuzean scholars who sympathize with Ted Kaczynski, quote, I'm okay with the possibility of dying from a toothache because the true cost of technology means that many others must die or live as slaves. These pictures are ex exercises in photographing the future. They tell narratives of imminently unfolding dystopias. A micro apartment renter stockpiles dried goods while high rise dwellers uber chopper from superstar architect buildings across the skyline of a flooded city. An isolationist state atop a man-made island imports all its goods as residents are luxuriously waited on by automated robot servants. My time studying this space seems to indicate and correspond with a broader trend of young ideologues and activists losing faith in the goals of the old left. Better jobs, higher wages, equality, a government for the people, or generally any meaningful improvement in their material well-being. Our failure to present a compelling vision of the future is currently losing the younger generation to nihilism. For the second year in a row, life expectancy in the United States has dropped. Cue the post left, it has to get worse before it gets worse. Okay. <laughs> this is the last one. Okay, so what is the post left? These terms are always contested. For me, the best definition goes something like this. Where Marx says that alienation arises with industrial capitalism from wage labor and the commodity form, the post-left would argue that alienation begins even earlier with agrarian societies and labor specialization. They claim that our inability to be self-sufficient has alienated us from our own nature, our environment, and essentially domesticated the human being. Their ideal society is a band of nomadic hunter-gatherers living off the natural abundance of the land. They frequently talk about imminent ecological disaster and the necessity for degrowth. Back in 2015, the post-left is almost non-existent on Politogram. Anarcho-primitivism is often the butt of jokes from just about every corner of the community. The few unironic and prim or green anarchy accounts that do exist have low engagement and post infrequently. While environmentalism is an, es is an essential component of the zeitgeist on Politogram, it is rarely the focal point around which these users orient their politics. At the time, these accounts generally describe themselves as anarcho-communist, syndicalist, or socialist. As the 2016 election cycle ignites the whole of American culture, these young radical leftists undergo a curious evolution in their political ideology. At first, many of them rally behind Bernie. When his positions are often, while his positions are often described as insufficiently radical and too centralized for their anti-authority leanings, they had a general consensus in their support. No candidate is perfect, but this one will do. When Bernie is ultimately defeated by the Democratic establishment, this group soon finds themselves without a suitable representative. DNC collusion with Hillary's campaign seems to vindicate many of their long-held anti-state sentiments. All types of centralization are now fully discredited. 
pro-anarchist posting flourishes. Once democratic socialism is off the table, these losers rapidly lose faith, faith in electoral politics. When Clinton is defeated in the general election, all hell breaks loose online. For the burgeoning post-left of Politogram, this is the final confirmation they need. Posts about anti-civilization and nihilism are now in full swing. It seems like every aspect of society is moving further towards a political right. The collapse is imminent. It's coming sooner than we thought. The irony of being an anti-tech radical on the internet is not lost on these teens. Everyone in today's society lives in constant contradiction of their ideals. In these young corners of the internet, everything is simultaneously ironic and genuine. While they rarely discuss it outright, my general assumption is that their hatred of technology is symptomatic of the times. Teenagers' lives are more permeated by social media than any other demographic. Many of these users fit the profile of the Kekistan 4chan type culture, isolated gamers and introverts without strong social ties IRL. Their banter is qualitatively similar in its edginess and rapid pace. As 2016 politicized all aspects of pop culture and moves, moved much of their demographic towards the right, these users radicalized in the opposite direction. Just a few years earlier, it would have been unimaginable to describe the 2016 memosphere and rightward political shift in youth culture. As the Overton window expands, new radical positions enter the mainstream. Young people have the most to lose in climate change scenarios. Ecological collapse is extraordinarily effective in radicalizing Gen Z. The images and chat logs reproduced here are sourced from a small but highly active community on Politogram. It would be impossible to represent this group in its entire entirety. I've tried to collect the, mo collect the most meaningful images, comments, and captions that may help to give you an idea of who these users are and what they believe. Okay, and I'll leave it there, and if you're interested to see more of it, it's available uh, on my website. It's archived on Library Stack. It's floating around various places on the, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we can talk about that. I'm sure we have a, a, a younger audience. I'm imagining that most people have uh, kind of watched this, uh, this skeptic memosphere uh, develop over the past few years. It feels, it feels very different than uh, the, the internet that I grew up with on like 2005 or so. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> questions or, or comments we can talk about. I hope that didn't go too long. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good um, question. I, I I think about that a lot too because uh, a seventeen-year-old radical uh, maybe sounds a, a little unusual in like twenty nineteen, but there's you know many other decades, and for most of human history, that is exactly the age that they they would have been. Um, there's a few things I think I'm I'm paraphrasing from um, a researcher who I I won't name because his anonymity is kind of dependent on the, the work that he does. But he, he kind of describes it this way, where um, you can imagine being a teenager at a punk show, and there's a, a white nationalist in the room, you would, you'd never talk to these guys. Uh, but there's something about the, the curiosity of the internet that people feel their perceived anonymity, they can kind of look into a forum and like, maybe I'll sample and see if this is for me. And, and by doing that, they get exposed to this, this stuff. Um, there's also a, a very different media landscape of, um, that um, previous to essentially like forever up until the internet, um, what the Southern Poverty Law Center refers to as the, the quarantine doctrine, which was um, not an official paper, but a, a general consensus among the media class 
that uh, the best way to combat these things was to not give them press. Um, and as, as evidence of that, there's an example I like to cite is in, um, in 1973, the American Nazi party marched 100 uniformed and armed soldiers down Euclid Avenue in Cleveland, and not a single press story was written about it. Uh, it's, it's unimaginable in, in today's world. So we have kind of two things happening at the same time, where it's the internet gives uh, publishing opportunities to everyone, and um, the media class um, becomes increasingly emaciated in their rigor because they are driven to, for outrageous uh, um, clickbait headlines to um, compete with other people in an attention economy. Uh, what I think Adam Curtis said it is uh, angry people click. Um, I think the, the other thing that I haven't, I've done some research on this and I haven't found any, any really good in-depth study of it, but the kind of qualitative assessment I would bring to it is the use of humor, where um, historically it seems that humor was uh, the kind of like European fascist regimes of the 1930s, um, they were explicitly racist. They didn't need to couch it in any kind of humor. Uh, so using humor as a recruitment tactic for extremists, uh, generally under those regimes, humor was the kind of subversive uh, radicals that, they, that you'd have a kind of, um, you know, like a communist group print their, their, uh, their, their publication and then they'd have a comedy uh, set afterwards, and they could always say, oh, I was just joking. I, I didn't actually mean it. We're not, we're not dissidents. Um, but now that has, and even after, after Charlottesville, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the name of the, the guy, but one of the organizers on the Facebook event was able to plead down his sentence by claiming that he was posting these things in irony, which is uh, clearly false. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I'm very, if, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Uh, I, I wonder if it's potentially something unique about the internet. I think of, of the internet that I grew up on in 2005, of playing World of Warcraft and being uh, in Baron's chat, which is just a brief description of that. That was the, the biggest zone and the kind of like most um, outrageous, that like it, that, you know, you could have a, a thousand people in there all typing at the same time and people would say uh, outrageous, offensive things. Um, that, th that feels somehow similar to it, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think this humor, perceived anonymity on the internet, feels qualitatively different, and I haven't seen uh, research that really addresses that. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Your talk really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's definitely there's been s some pro side for us. I don't think there's much of a pro side for a Congolese coal tan miner. You know, these are without exaggeration the uh, villages with one working phone that don't have electricity, that don't have paved roads or, or anything like that. Um, so the idea that like tech and civilization is this kind of progressive project that through the system of uh, like capitalist expansion like slowly lifts everyone up is uh, maybe, and I'm, I, I certainly emphasize the cons in this, but I think that's because the, the general assumption up until 2016, I wanna say um, through events like Occupy Wall Street and the events of the Arab Spring that there was this uh, latent California ideology in it that uh, social media was a democratic space and because it was uh, a way for people to connect with people that it was a, a tool of the of the people and a tool of the left. The left is the, the collective uh, group. But um, 
the, the book to look at for this is um, Fred Turner, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, um, or Adam Curtis, uh, it's a three-part documentary series on the BBC uh, called All Watch Over Our Machines of Loving Grace. And um, it kind of looks at the ideological roots of the, um, the kind of the 60s hippies and how um, the Whole Earth Catalog became the uh, Whole Earth Electronic Link and, and Stuart Brand's uh, ideology of the information wants to be free. Uh, and that kind of became an envelope for this type of thinking that, um, uh, that, that the internet was going to be a place of, of liberation. But I, to, to kind of, I, I think, address, you know, because you, you have r tapped into something. There, there's uh, truth that like with your smartphone, you can kind of like show your talents to the world and, and, and rise to stardom. I mean, you could. I mean, you could have. Uh, well, maybe address like one one thing at a time, because I think there's actually. I, I don't mean to like fixate on it, but there's a lot of things that go into that kind of idea. So like DJ Khaled is is one of these guys who is like, you can show your talents to the world. Quite literally says this like now that you have the smartphone, and it's this idea. Um, uh, like that these social networks have allowed us to do meritocracy, right? And I think if you look at the things that rise to the top of this perceived like so-called meritocracy on, on the internet, it's stuff like Kim Kardashian, you know, which is not really, it's kind of like the, the dregs of like people are embarrassed to be following it. And it's like no, no one, no, I don't think anyone really wants that to be like the, the face of the kind of the online world. Um, there's, uh, there, there's a book by Sean C. Scott called Millennials, uh, Millennials and the Moments That Made Us, I think it's called. And he talks about, um, he's mostly writing about uh, rap culture, and he talks about, uh, Jay-Z has this famous quote, if you could drop me on a desert island and I'd still become me, right? And this, this idea of, um, of meritocracy kind of allows you to rationalize um, brutal treatment of just about everyone else who doesn't make it, right? And if you were to take this kind of uh, like a, a traditional humanist position of like people are essentially clay and they are molded by their environments, what you would want to do to create the best content or the best art or the best what have you is that you would create a nurturing environment in which people can flourish rather than having to compete with each other. I think, I, I think, yeah, maybe there's something else that'll come back to me. So I think the, the environment of the internet is like there's like the internet as a whole is a separate thing, but focusing mm -hmm. specifically on social media is um, the kind of the latent ideology of the people who designed it is this thing called the California ideology, which is um, essentially creating feedback loops and an ecological harmony that they would describe as um, uh, like a self-organizing network. And through that, you could do away with the structure of government that the new left at the time felt was oppressive. And this is kind of uh, in the era of the, the Vietnam War as well. Is you know quite um, it's it's a very old history. It's from like the the 60s up to California ideology is sometimes called dot com neoliberalism as well. Um, yeah, but they uh, they built a space in which entrepreneurial creatives can build a personal brand. And everyone else has their wages cut by kind of scab platforms like Uber or, or what have you, right? Um, they're just finding yet unregulated sectors of the economy and, and destroying the wealth that people have built for themselves. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical of it, especially because I think that has been the kind of general assumption up until 2016 where we've seen populist right-wing movements online. And that has turned the thing. Like if you remember during um, during the the Arab Spring, like Twitter was congratulating itself by allowing these leaderless crowds to assemble and, and protest and overthrow their their government. And now you can't find a story about social media that doesn't have either like 
Russian trolls or fake news on it. You know, there's been a total narrative switch, and it makes makes you think that maybe maybe these spaces never belonged to us in the first place. You know, maybe they've been working against us. <laughs> Sorry, this is a long answer. Well, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm following you. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're, I think you're appropriately picking up on um, a kind of shift throughout it, where like the jogging stuff. Although I think we were kind of aware that the internet maybe wasn't working or sh sculpting society in the way that we wanted, we were still pretty hopeful about it and trying to create this like, you know, popular engagement for a mass audience. And the memes are certainly part of that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to like exist in your utopia outside of the existing system <laughs> you know so uh, I think you um, you find a different projects aim for a bottom up you know mass thing and different uh, projects aim for a top down you know there's not a, there's not a one size fits all solution for it Yeah. identified like a, a current crisis in the art world um, and it's it's a little bit of like uh, if you hate capitalism why are you using an iPhone like it's hard to exit the art world when you're dependent on the art world for a portion of your income um, but there was a there was a period where myself and my peer group were living very comfortably off of the sales of our work in commercial galleries and then with the kind of market correction everybody very quickly learned that they were actually a freelancer with very few applicable skills um, but I think there's a, a period right now that has been kind of um, this question of the mass engagement with work online has kind of been countered by the idea of uh, alg algor algorithmically constructed filter bubbles that you're not really getting a like kind of broad, uh, you know, d diverse audience for your work. You're getting people, you're reaching people who are almost, you know, as close to you demographic wise as possible and at least uh, politically. Um, there's, there's one more thing. Sorry, I, I, I see. Um, oh, and in the so in the kind of the waning of the commercial market, and um, in seeing the, like major figures of the art world embrace these very neoliberal positions, uh, artists in I think my kind of circle have really had to um, reconsider their, their engagement in the in the art world and take more of a discursive role that uh, we have to do some kind of um, kind of agenda setting and, and research to supplement the, the works in the gallery. And I think it was aptly described by Aria Dean on the, the latest Rhizome podcast that 
Um, the most interesting things happening in the art world now are these conversations, and if the artworks create, occupy a space in a gallery that allows us to have these conversations, that's still a net positive. asked me like when I was a student and it's like the, the strategy was like, yeah you're supposed to work online and then people offer you opportunities um, and that but, th but that was at the time where you know there were like 20 year olds in Chicago I'm thinking of a specific person who had you know a hundredfold the followers of David Zwerner Gagosian and you know Hauser and Wirth combined and now you look at the landscape and it's really accumulated the people who had power in the beginning they've learned the analytics they've learned how to do this um, and so those kind of face-to-face -face interactions become increasingly more important. And I think part of this, like, this questioning of, you know, what am I doing in the, in the art world? Like, if you're not being paid for it and you constantly have a dissenting opinion and, like, <laughs> you're saying things that people don't want to hear, you really have to kind of be pretty certain that what you're doing, you think it's important, you know, and you have to find people that you you really want to build something with and realize that you're all going out of pocket and likely not going to be rewarded for it. But uh, I've, you know, I've, I've gone through that and I'm, I'm pretty convinced that there's a few people who I'm very invested in what they do and I think what we're building together is important. And, you know, things like this, which is maybe like the bottom up strategy that we were talking about, like not everyone is going to go to a gallery and have this kind of lengthy discourse about art, but, you'll find a, a ton of people who like will read the PDF and look at the memes and you know there's different types of engagements in different formats that, that we can try and use. tapped into it where um, I guess the, the the other thing is kind of like undiscussed but I guess implied through this thing about the, the, the right-wing youth memes is that it's kind of like the Gramscian wet dream of how to influence culture right is you would make this kind of popular artwork and that would incite people to you know like create political ideology or whatnot um, the <laughs> I guess uh, 
what we're what we're starting to learn is that the um, kind of like the, the the lip service of the the art world's progressive values is um, really like paling in comparison to the reality, right? So I, I think immediately of the, um, the the Sackler family that's being protested, which are essentially the architects of the opioid ep epidemic in uh, in middle America and is the reason for the declining life expectancy in the, the US. So um, it really makes one kind of reconsider, uh, you know, what, what these kind of surface level like aesthetic things mean um, I think the, I, I think the unfortunate solution is that art does not play much role in it, right? But after the revolution, I'm very hopeful that the art has been going on and I would like to see what people did under, under that society. Um, I, I think it's probably we're learning that these like old left narratives are maybe more useful, uh, like organizing from position of, of labor and there's left acceleration and stuff that I'm interested in as well. Um, but you had, you had one more, um, Oh, one more. Oh, maybe I, I lost it. Maybe it'll come back. Uh, that was like, oh, it's a really good. You just put a bow on everything too. Uh, no, okay. No, it'll it'll come back to me. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, okay. This is it. Um, so I want to I want to reference the work of uh, my longtime collaborator and friend Brad Trammell, which is uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing what he said, which is um, his work is really he has kind of pretty much exited entirely the contemporary art world. Right, and had a, a lucrative career as a commercial artist, and then in the market correction, we all kind of you know caught the shit under the stick. And he has reinvented himself as a kind of Patreon content producer for the art world, and now he's uh, ex 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 or living subsisting off of that that money, where people pay for content. And our kind of kind of meme activity, which he is much more so engaged than I am. Um, is that people don't even realize, like the, the art student and the, the young artist has so thoroughly internalized mer meritocracy that they really believe that they deserve the terrible conditions they live in. <laughs> and this becomes extremely clear when you realize that your peer at a comparable gallery to you is making hundreds of thousands of dollars while you're maxing out your credit card. Like when you live that material reality, you, you you start to learn how little uh, distribution would radically affect your material well-being. Um, and so Brad's kind of idea is that we don't even need to start like building like some like political project or whatever and build, like doing a party yet. It's like what we need to do is agenda setting for the people who are most ready to hear our position, which is artists who are maybe not in, in Canada, but in, in the US, $100,000 in debt, uh, working a precarious freelance job struggling to meet their rent and wondering how they're ever going to achieve any kind of well-being in their lifetime. Um, because, you know, those all sound like awful things, but if you really believe that the art that's in the canon and the people who are winning at the market deserve their success, then subsequently you believe that you deserve your immiseration. And that's, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that.
so we're talking about kind of like photographs of artworks, not like browser-based art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think jogging was specific to its time, and it was specific to the mass adoption of social, social media among young people. Um, I, don't, I don't think there, there is a way to do it now. You know, like what, whatever you put onto Facebook is going to get just, unless you start with a million followers or whatever, it's just going to get crushed in the algorithm. You know, um, it's there to kind of reproduce existing structures of, of power. Uh, I, I think maybe there's some solutions for it where, you know, Facebook is you know, like a monopoly and should be <laughs> broken apart into uh, other uh, communities, you know, um, and that then you might have more of a fighting chance if they were like, s separated appropriately. Um, but I'm. Yeah, but that's like Elo, right? Does anybody remember Elo? Like, it's, like it started and it was invite only, and then people were like, "We don't want an invite. It's not cool." Like, <laughs> uh, like the, the network effect. She kind of nailed it there. It's just like, uh, it's like an insurmountable kind of uh, power, you know. I kind of think all of these things are like artists struggle to just like reproduce their their, their, their themselves and pay their rent. Um, and uh, like all of these things are connected to essentially the rising cost of, of living and that it's, it's through regulating things like rent and healthcare for the US is a big one and things like this where we can just allow people to have more financial latitude to take experiment, experimentation and like take creative risks and um, not have to like our, our kind of mass media entertainment is algorithm, it's like data scraped Right, they they scrape the data. Like the classic example is um, House of Cards, right, which was sold as essentially like a description of a data package that people who were watching. I think David Fincher, the, the director, were also watching Kevin Spacey movies, and they uh, kind of like justify the amount of resources they put into it based on the expected return. Um, I think to avoid that culture and have space for these kind of experimental, weird artist things, like. It's all part of one struggle, you know? I don't know if there's a, a thing of the past that we could kind of use to, to turn us back around. Is that it? I feel like there's two pieces that snowballed for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can do that later as well, too. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a question in the back? I, th I think you're, I think you're totally right. Um, I think you're totally right. But the the issue is that, you know, we live in a society in a society that is kind of like a ledger or a balance sheet, and the way that society determines success is market success. But I, I think you're totally, uh, you're 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 really hitting the nail on the head of like, there's no amount of kind of like Gramscian like influencing culture through memes or images or artwork that's going to correct the course of privatizing anything that moves, right? So if aesthetics don't have, or, or, or capital A art doesn't have a role in that, maybe aesthetics has a role in it, um, then what you do if you become a Sunday painter and that's your fulfilling thing and that's your definition of success, then I think you, you're 100% right. Um, 
in the yeah, in, in, in the meantime, um, unfortunately, it's just, you know, I, I think it shouldn't, I guess the, the thing is you shouldn't just be a Sunday painter. Like, I want you to be a, you know, I'll, I'll be generous and say, like, Wednesday through Sunday, and then you have to work two days a week, and your housing is taken care of, and your health care, and all, and all that stuff, um, and then you kind of define your own success and have your own self-determination. And um, Yeah, I, d I don't disagree with you. Thank you very much.